Welcome live from reInvent in Las Vegas for the recap for Tuesday. Uh, reInvent, if this is the first time you're tuning in, this is a different, different type of conference from normal technology industry conferences. It's not a sales and marketing conference, it's a learning and education conference. We have over 2,100 sessions going on here uh, over the week, and half of those are from customers and partners. Today we're going to give you a full recap on what's been announced so far from Midnight Madness, Monday Night Live, and the other keynotes. Uh, today I'm going to get started with networking. So if you're in hybrid cloud, if you're running something on-premise, uh, if you're moving into things like multi-region deploys, we have got some uh, great announcements that we've already done uh, over the course of the last couple of days. The first one is Elastic Fabric Adapter. Uh, it allows you to do 100 gig networking between your instances. Uh, it is really useful for uh, high performance workloads, uh, very low latency, uh, and very cool if you're trying to do cluster style uh, workloads. We've also announced AWS Global Accelerator. So it is a global service that allows you to onboard traffic to your regions uh, through network peering locations uh, and allows you to fail over within less than a minute between regions. Uh, it's very powerful if you need to uh, serve multiple customers around the world from different locations. Uh, it's geographically distributed uh, and is integrated with a whole bunch of our other services. We also have Transit Gateway. Transit Gateway is uh, an aggregator of sorts for all of the different links that you have going on inside AWS. So if you have multiple direct connects, you have VPNs, you have remote offices, Transit Gateway will give you one ingress and one egress point for you to manage all of your traffic. That's uh, pretty much it for networking. I'm going to hand over to my uh, co-host, uh, Dr. Pete Stansky, and he's uh, going to talk you through some other exciting announcements. Thanks, Sean, and hi to all of you guys tuning in for Asia Pacific, and in particular Australia and New Zealand. Uh, so guys, who doesn't love robots? I think everyone's uh, got a big passion for those. So uh, we've just announced AWS RoboMaker, and essentially it's a, it's a service that actually helps developers to build, test, and experiment with robotics. So we've taken um, the robot operating system, or ROS, uh, which is also both a framework and an OS, uh, and give you the ability to actually create some really interesting robotic scenarios which are connected to the actual cloud. So you can actually take uh, vision and use AWS Kinesis video to actually stream, uh, use SageMaker to then be able to understand things, and we wrap this all around inside Cloud9, the uh, ID in the cloud, uh, which means if you're a Python developer or you want to experiment with building robots, by the way, you can build robots which are virtual that actually live inside the cloud, and then you can build them, test them, experiment with them, build the ML models behind them that are going to make it more intelligent, and then deploy them to actual physical mechanical robots, uh, which is very, very impressive. So whether you're NASA, or uh, Black & Decker or building any kind of robots and my kids have got a robot so when I get home back to Australia I'll be playing with this with them. Um, it's a very exciting platform to actually play with. Uh, so if robotics is one thing, um, there are also additional IoT announcements that we've actually made. There are four additional ones of those. Um, so we also announced AWS IoT SiteWise. So think of SiteWise as ha having the ability to collect data uh, from something that perhaps might be inside of your building or your factory floor. Uh, we take that information from all those IoT sensors and we can analyze them, uh, see what's in there, we group them, um, and then we can also push them into the AWS IoT events. And these events can then trigger off certain activities uh, on the basis of a sensor going off um, or some button being pushed or the conveyor belt potentially breaking down. If that wasn't enough, uh, we're also making IoT a little bit easier for you to connect with things. So we have something called AWS IoT Graph Things. Uh, imagine being in a visual environment where you can drag and drop and create relationships between IoT devices. So you could actually have a weather sensor that detects a certain temperature change being wired to potentially some other IoT device that it kicks off and turns off, turns on or off a thermostat uh, to control some of those things. Um, and finally, the other cool announcement around AWS IoT Greengrass connectors is the ability to then take all those IoT devices, connect them to third-party tools like Splunk potentially uh, or other AWS services and create a much more connected IoT solution uh, that you may have actually built. So Sean, I'm going to throw it back to you to talk about the AWS Marketplace. Cool, that's a pretty good overcap, Pete. I'm looking forward to the uh, simple Pete service rolling around the <laughs> office uh, using our robotic services. Awesome. So uh, we've had the AWS Marketplace now for over six years. Uh, it's one of a very popular service that allows you to buy third-party software subscriptions. Uh, think about things like F5, Splunk, other types of software that you may use on-premise that you want to subscribe to in the cloud. Uh, today we actually announced a uh, private marketplace for the AWS Marketplace. So if you're, a net, if you're an administrator or an enterprise and you'd like to list 
uh, only whitelisted software, you can build yourself an, uh, your own private marketplace where you can get products uh, that you have already vetted uh, and anyone who's a downstream subscriber or a user uh, knows that they can get those subscriptions without worrying about, uh, without worrying about uh, whether they need to get them approved. So Steve, I'm going to hand over to you now. I heard, uh, I think we had some exciting announcements around machine learning and AI. Sure, so today we announced a new machine learning product which was really exciting for our customers in the medical sector. So we announced uh, Amazon Comprehend Medical. Amazon Comprehend Medical is a natural language processing service that allows you to look for medical text in, or medical entities inside unstructured text. So we'll look for things like medical condition, uh, medication names, dosage, strength of dosage. We'll also look for patient identifiable information such as patient age or their, uh, their health insurance number, for example. And we provide these capabilities to our medical customers. So it's a nice slant on our Comprehend product to add uh, uh, specific features for our customers in the healthcare sector, which is really interesting and a, a good step forward for that sector. Uh, we also announced some stuff uh, around satellites and space, which is really cool. Um, Sean, I'll hand back to you. I know you're quite excited about this. Yeah, so uh, we announced today uh, AWS Ground Station. Uh, so it is a fully managed service that lets you collect data uh, from satellites. So if you're already collecting data from satellites, GIS data, oil and gas kind of exploration data, uh, maybe satellite mapping, uh, you can now use the AWS Ground Station service. Uh, we've lit it up in two areas, uh, and it will actually, as the satellite flies over, process that analog stream and allow you to uh, ingest that data into the cloud. So it's a very cool feature. You know, building this kind of uh, technology yourself is capital intensive and takes a long time. Uh, and we're providing the benefit we always provide with AWS services, which is you pay as you go, no capital up front. Uh, and you can start using the ground station services. Uh, so I'm looking forward to how people use that. I'm looking forward to you know, looking at all the different satellites that we connect to in the future and, and customers talking about it. So uh, Steve, uh, you know, one thing that's very important and kind of fundamental technology to us is uh, storage. You know, S3 has been there for a long time. It's kind of the foundation services. Uh, you know, what kind of exciting things have we got going on S3? Yeah, so S3 has been around for a long time, but we We've made some major enhancements this week. Actually, I've got six announcements to share to S3 today. The first one is S3 Batch Operations. This is the ability to run operations at batch on millions or billions of S3 objects at one time. So if you want to, uh, for example, update the metadata of your S3 objects, you can now update metadata on millions or billions of objects at the same time. Uh, the second feature we announced is uh, S3 Intelligent Tiering. Intelligent Tiering is a new storage class for S3, which uh, couples together frequent and infrequent uh, uh, access tiers, and we'll, using machine learning, we'll monitor your data and your access patterns to automatically move data between tiers based on usage. So for data that's older than 30 days old, it will automatically get uh, moved into the infrequent access tier, but if you access that data, it will automatically move back, so there's no longer a requirement to use uh, lifecycle policies to manage your uh, cost on Amazon S3. Uh, the third thing we announced is that we can now have a unified API so we can directly put data into Amazon Glacier. Uh, no longer do we have to uh, put data into S3 and use a lifecycle policy to move it into uh, Glacier after uh, even zero days. You can now have an API to talk directly into, uh, into AWS Glacier. Um, the next thing is S3 object lock, and this is the ability to block object version deletion during a retention period that's defined by our customers. Um, so that's a global feature, so you, lock, you can lock that across multiple uh, S3 buckets uh, globally. Uh, and then the final S3 specific uh, one is the S3 restore speed upgrade. So you can now issue a second uh, API call to Amazon uh, S3 to restore objects from Glacier at a faster pace than the typical time it would take to restore Glacier objects. Uh, finally, which is related to S3, we announced a new service called AWS Transfer for SFTP. So this is the ability to put an SFTP interface in front of your S3 bucket. Um, and it, um, it's a secure FTP, obviously, and it uses uh, quite nicely as a kind of cloud implementation of SFTP. So it uses uh, IAM, uh, Identity and Access Management product from AWS to authenticate users against the, uh, the SFTP endpoint. 
So you upload your uh, SSH public keys in, uh, and assign them to your IAM users so you can access uh, those objects. The other cool thing about this is that un behind, it's not a black box product, so under the hood it's actually a, an S3 bucket that you can access using typical S3 APIs. So that means you can now use SFTP to upload data and then trigger things like Lambda functions off of those S3 put events and you can now use uh, integrate Lambda from SFTP which is going to, I think, open up some quite cool use cases for our customers. Uh, Ian, we, uh, we announced some stuff around DynamoDB today here at the Launchpad, so yeah, we talked about Yeah, I was delighted to be joined on the Launchpad today by Werner Vogels, the CTO of Amazon.com, and Werner announced a new feature for DynamoDB, which is DynamoDB transaction support. So this allows you to commit changes to a variety of documents within a single DynamoDB table, or to commit changes to documents across a variety of different tables as a single operation with a failure condition management. So if for any reason your transaction cannot be committed to all of the documents that are in scope for that particular transaction, it can be rolled back out again. So you can do this to build things like uh, commerce applications where you might be trading items between users, atomically updating ownership and shifting funds between users, say inside a MMO game, for example, if you built a schema uh, data model for that using, using DynamoDB tables as a back end. Uh, so that was an announcement uh, early this afternoon on the, on the launch pad. Uh, and obviously is a solution and a service that is used for a lot of high performance applications where customers are interested in really uh, responsive uh, performance for their data intensive applications. And in the same kind of area, we announced an open source project, uh, which you're going to talk about, Pete, for performance improvement in virtualization as well. Absolutely, I'm super excited about this. Now, by the way, we do a lot of open source work, as you guys are probably aware, but uh, just uh, now we're announcing something called Firecracker. Uh, and Firecracker essentially is, is open source, which is a lightweight, virtual agent technology that was purpose built for basically running containers and serverless applications. The cool idea behind this is that you can now take this and run it wherever you like. You can run it even on your laptop. Um, it's got a really low overhead for every micro virtual machine that uh, you launch. Uh, there's only a five megabyte overhead, which is tiny and phenomenally fast to launch because we can actually launch them at less than 125 milliseconds. So inside about 60, inside a second, you can launch about 150 micro VMs. So if you actually are very passionate about serverless, as, and I certainly am, um, being able to take this experiment with it. It was built in Rust. Uh, go check out um, the, the actual project. You can take it, run it on your laptop, uh, in your existing data centers, in, in EC2. Uh, go off and experiment. Um, I think it's a really great example of, of innovation at scale, and uh, hopefully it's going to get a lot of the developers very excited about this, and also a lot of the infrastructure folks uh, to kick off. So Ian, uh, back to developers. Tell us about the Kinesis side of things. Yeah, this was another uh, launch pad launch this afternoon. Uh, Kinesis Data Analytics is an existing service that allows allows you to establish SQL operations on streaming data. So you can write an SQL statement, upload it to Kinesis, and then get the results back from that statement as your data flows through a Kinesis stream. What we announced today is an enhancement for Kinesis data analytics that allows you to compile and upload Java stream processing applications and have those operate inside your Kinesis stream. So the developer experience is download our application development kit, which includes Flink, plus our own SDKs for building streaming data processing apps in Java, compile that into Java bytecode, ship your jar up to uh, Amazon Kinesis Data Analytics, and then we'll deploy and scale that application and enable you to operate on streaming data with your own custom Java code. Awesome. It includes built-in operators for things like uh, long-running calculations, uh, so for aggregates, uh, sliding window analysis, min and max, and the kind of regular features that you'd expect to see. Because it's customized, you can integrate your streaming data applications with other endpoints, so you can select data using those operators and put aggregates into other services like DynamoDB to have rapidly updating dashboards. So it's a really, really flexible service for Java developers that want more power in their streaming data applications. Cool. So uh, the last major announcement we're going to talk about uh, today is the Amplify console. Uh, this was something we announced um, uh, earlier on in reInvent, but it's been very popular with our customers in the serverless space. So that AWS Amplify console extends the AWS Amplify framework uh, and provides a managed continuous deployment and hosting service for modern applications. So it integrates with uh, Bitbucket, GitHub, GitLab, GitLab and uh, <laughs> AWS code commit to, uh, uh, to allow you to basically push your code and deploy uh, modern applications. The nice thing about this is it manages uh, your 
uh, front-end applications as well. So if you use static site generators, for example, like Hugo or Jekyll, you can now push your code to one of those code repositories and trigger, trigger a uh, deployment in uh, AWS Amplify Console and upload your static sites and Amplify Console takes care of custom domain management, SSL, and those kind of things for you as well. But beyond just front-end applications, if you uh, have back-end integrations in your application, uh, specifically you're using the AWS Amplify uh, framework, uh, the Amplify console will recognize when you push your application that it has uh, Amplify back-end resources configured and create a build spec for you that will actually go and deploy the CloudFormation that is part of the Amplify uh, framework to deploy back-end resources such as authentication with Cognito or APIs with API Gateway or uh, AWS AppSync. So it really offers a, a new way for our developers to think about deploying modern web applications on AWS. Got one question off the stream here from Moo9, which is what are the use cases for micro VMs created with Firecracker? Do you want to answer yeah. that, Pete? Awesome, thank you for that. Um, so imagine being able to run your own, essentially serverless own yes. container infrastructure uh, on your own laptop. Uh, experiment, uh, scale out, uh, if you're building potentially, uh, I talked about IoT earlier, I mean there's nothing stopping you if you have a, you know, a sufficiently grunty um, laptop or a device, IoT device, you could actually start running your own uh, micro functions. Uh, very small VMs, I didn't also spend enough time talking about how secure this thing is. Yep. Um, this is a highly secure runtime support environment um, that actually has great levels of isolation. Uh, that's one of the challenges, obviously, when it comes to running secure environment that's multi-tenanted. Um, basically, Firecracker gives you great isolation between the running processes. It's running in user space, mind you, uh, which gives us that extra boost in terms of performance and being able to launch these things quickly. Uh, so if you wanted to do um, your own Lambda, your own functions for any kind of purpose, uh, now you can essentially on any kind of compute platform. And this is the uh, service that underpins our own AWS Fargate uh, container service and also underpins Lambda as well. So it's already in use for AWS services. And battle and tested, right? Yeah, and battle yeah, tested. One of the nice characteristics of open source software projects, of course, is verifiability. So if you want to take a look at how the isolation security containment works, you can evaluate the code base yourself and figure out whether or not this is actually a secure product that meets your needs. It's one of the nice characteristics of development in the open. Yeah, go fork it and play with it. Exactly yeah. right. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think for SaaS companies as well who need to do that multi-tenant, it's going to be a game changer for them. You know, not having to do dedicated hosts and, and, uh, and going around with different customers. Yeah. Uh, all right, so uh, before we uh, close out, we've uh, already had a couple of days worth of announcements. Uh, I'll ask each host, what's your favorite announcement so far? I'm going to go for the launch that I did with Werner early on today, so DynamoDB transactions. I think that's my favorite of the Because of the technology or the person? Uh, <laughs> no, he's a, he's a, let's just say a larger than life character, so it's always fun to, <laughs> to be on stage and interacting with him. So yeah, definitely that. Steve? Awesome. Cool. Uh, mine would probably be the Amplify console that we just spoke about. I think it uh, really simplifies the developer experience and puts the de developer as a first class citizen. So I think that's a, a great addition to the Amplify framework. Um, so that's probably my favorite one so far. Okay. Mine's an easy one, Firecracker. I mean, how cool is this that you can actually run your own serverless functions on your laptop and spin up you know, hundreds of these things inside 60 seconds? Uh, I think it might have to be Global Accelerator. It just solves so many problems I've heard customers talking about. Uh, I wrote the blog post for it, so I'm probably like a little bit biased. <laughs> um, it's well yeah, worth reading. I ended up proofreading so it. Right? It's, uh, <laughs> yeah, it's a great service, and it's going uh, to get a lot of use from our customers, even if they're running in a single region. Uh, so we're streaming all day uh, tomorrow, starting with Andy Jassy's keynote. Uh, you know, one thing I used to love as a customer of AWS, watching the keynotes, was the stats that we used to release and the kind of updates. Uh, there's a couple that have already come out of the, the existing keynotes. So uh, DynamoDB usage internally for Amazon now exceeds 10 trillion requests per day. Peaks at 20 million requests per second. It's just crazy. Phenomenal. You know, we've been around 12 years, but I still forget about how large we actually are. The scale's massive. Yeah, and the second one is our S3 processes peaks of 60 terabits per second of our data, which is just... Nuts. Yeah. So that's uh, the end of the recap for Tuesday. We'll have another one tomorrow for uh, Wednesday, same time, uh, in this format. Uh, so please join us then, and uh, please join us in the stream tomorrow for all the other uh, great people we'll have on Launchpad. Ciao. Thank you.